Okay, let's get started. Can you still hear me? Yep, you're good to go. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, my name is uh, Rene Kolga, and I have always uh, dreamed of uh, speaking at uh, B-Sides uh, SLC, so um, this is dream come true. I uh, really appreciate the organizers and the sponsors for, to, for putting this together. Uh, topic of the day, I think it's a pretty uh, hot uh, uh, topic, ransomware. We, we, even though, uh, believe it or not, ransomware started back in the 80s, but um, three, four decades later, we still, uh, for some reason, seem to be unable to tackle that problem. And that's exactly what my presentation today is about. Um, quickly about myself, Rene Kolga, I've been in security for quite some time, uh, worked for companies like Alteris, Symantec, Citrix, and a number of startups, uh, mostly in the areas of anti-malware, encryption, and insider threat. So today's talk is, um, uh, is about uh, uh, ransomware and why we can't uh, seem to be able to tackle this problem. Uh, I will very briefly talk about how ransomware works. Then I'll uh, spend some time going over four uh, typical methods uh, that the cybersecurity industry and the endpoint security products attempt to detect and stop ransomware with uh, all of their pros and cons. Then I'll talk about uh, how things can get even worse and talk about one of the evasion techniques that ransomware can uh, potentially leverage to be even more deadly. And finally, I'll show uh, a couple of uh, live examples of um, ransomware that's uh, bypassing two major endpoint security products. So let's get going. I've already showed uh, this and shared my, uh, my uh, desire for, for a connection in these uh, strange times. So again, appreciate that the organizers uh, uh, decided to continue with the event even in this online form. Okay, so let's get to down to business. How, um, what's the typical ransomware workflow? Uh, I'm not gonna talk about how ransomware gets in, whether it's phishing, insecure RDP, or something like that, right? That's irrelevant. We all know that the bad guys will find a way. But the, what happens then? Uh, obviously, a ransomware uh, tries to find your valuable files, your office data, maybe a database, uh, maybe uh, pictures, uh, it tries to, uh, uh, it will uh, keep the system files um, in place because uh, it wants the OS to be still bootable so it can display the message and, and ask you for some Bitcoins. So it uh, reads those files that it wants to encrypt. It encrypts the content and memory. And then it has a, a choice of what to do, how to uh, get rid of the original unencrypted files. And it can choose to do one of the following things. And, and there are other ways as well. And I'm just listing three here. One option is to uh, uh, save the new encrypted file on disk uh, and then use a, a delete file operation to get rid of the original file. Another option, pretty devious one, is to write the encrypted data straight back into the same file, into the original file, and maybe even keep the same file name. Uh, and that may... Um, make the restoration uh, even more difficult. And then uh, another option is to uh, uh, create a new file uh, on, on the disk and then replace the original file using a rename operation. So these are just um, a, a few ways um, a ransomware can uh, get rid of the original uh, data. And that's pretty important to understand uh, um, uh, if you want to stop uh, ransomware, right? So now let's uh, look at the uh, various detection methods that the industry has been putting forward to try to detect and stop ransomware. And as we all see from the news, obviously those attempts so far have not been very successful, unfortunately. And I'll describe and explain exactly why. So let's start with uh, one of the more basic uh, Static file analysis. This is um, um, this is a generic approach that uh, antivirus and anti-malware and anti-ransomware products uh, leverage to stop uh, any virus, including uh, ransomware. So it's not specifically designed to ransomware per se, uh, 
Um, but uh, so this is where um, uh, an antivirus or a similar product looks for some uh, uh, signature, right? It can be a sequence of uh, terms, words, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, what are the pros? Well, um, false positive rate, uh, FB rate is pretty low. It's very rare when an antivirus product uh, says that uh, and, uh, this binary is malicious while it actually isn't. So that's, that's obviously uh, a plus because we're already, as security professionals, we are overwhelmed with uh, those alerts and false positives. Uh, it's, um, what else? Another good, uh, the last bullet point here is, is pretty important actually. It stops attack before any files are encrypted. So it does not sacrifice any files before it triggers the defenses. So that's great. Um, what, uh, what are the cons? Well, obviously we all know uh, signature-based um, uh, uh, tools are pretty easy to bypass, even if they leverage uh, uh, and, uh, machine learning or AI-based signature. Uh, so it's, it's pretty easy to bypass. Uh, so hence, uh, false negative rate is pretty high. And how the bad guys uh, um, uh, how how do the bad guys bypass those uh, defenses? Well, they use cryptors, packers, uh, and various ways of obfuscating and changing those uh, those signatures for every attack they launch. Okay, so let's move on to uh, another technique, another pretty basic, even uh, surprising technique, I would say is a common file uh, extension blacklist based approach where um, a security product will look for well-known ransomware extensions and say, oh, look, if a file is being created with this uh, file extension, you know, that's something, then it must be ransomware, so we are gonna stop it. And what are the pros? Well, pretty low FP rate. Um, uh, and um, again, the, no damage is done, or maybe one file is sacrificed to ransomware, but then uh, defenses kick in and the ransomware is stopped. Well, obviously I, I don't need to explain probably that it is very trivial for, uh, for attackers, for ransomware writers to bypass, unfortunately. <clears throat> the only thing they need to do is to um, use um, you know, a random file extension or, or change a file, uh, file extension or not rename files at all, right? Keep the same uh, file name with the same extension after they encrypt the data. And uh, if uh, you don't believe that uh, these, uh, these tools are actually, the, this technique is actually being used in some of the leading security products. I've obfuscated the, <clears throat> the, the logo of the product here but um, you can see uh, this one of the radio buttons, file encryption, a process that created a file with a known ransomware extension was terminated. And then there is even a separate setting specifically for Loki ransomware. So believe it or not, that method is actually being used. Uh, next, deception, right? This is where um, a security product would create a set of files, kind of bait files, and if any of those files are touched, then, uh, uh, then we can commit the process that, uh, that touched uh, those files uh, as ransomware. So uh, it, it has uh, a benefit that it can detect ransomware that other methods may not be able to detect or stop, like the static file analysis, the first method we looked at. Uh, what are the cons? Well, obviously there is a very high chance for FPs here false positives because um, typically, uh, well, because one, the user can touch those files or, or a program uh, can touch those files and hence trigger those defensive mechanisms. Um, and then um, of course the bad guys know about all these methods. So uh, as these bait files or, or honeypot files tend to be created as hidden uh, files or folders, uh, ransomware can just bypass and skip those uh, those uh, hidden all hidden files and folders and hence not trigger this particular method. Okay, moving on to a little bit more advanced techniques. Uh, one being the mass file operation. 
what is ransomware no what is ransomware typically known to be doing right it will do a lot of reads and writes and probably delete or rename operations well what if we define some kind of a threshold a limit like if we see so many uh, of, of these file operations within a, a certain period of time then it seems like this is ransomware so again, that it's it's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, so hence, it can detect some of the ransomware that the other methods may not be able to detect. But um, obviously, uh, there is a concern about false positives here as well, because you, as a user, may be legitimately just moving one folder to another, right? And that would potentially trigger this threshold. Uh, and then um, some files will likely get encrypted. They will get sacrificed before this threshold is uh, met. And uh, finally, uh, the, the attackers, how attackers bypass the, these methods, they, uh, <clears throat> they uh, either uh, slow down the encryption process or potentially spawn multiple uh, processes for, uh, for different files that they're encrypting. Um, I believe the the infamous uh, Locker Goga um, a ransomware uh, actually was launching a separate thread for each uh, file they wanted to encrypt, and hence the encryption itself was actually super slow. Uh, but maybe that's why um, uh, Locker Goga was able to bypass even so-called next generation antivirus products uh, and uh, cause significant damage. And finally, um, kind of a variation on the previous method is the um, uh, measure method that measures the change within the, the data itself, within the files. It's not just looking at the uh, mass file operations, but actually looking at the content of the data and measure the randomness, for example, of the data uh, using uh, an entropy calculation, for example. Um, Again, um, there, are, there are pluses like with all uh, methods uh, and uh, it will have fewer FPs than the previously described method uh, because this is uh, more uh, sophisticated. It's not just looking at the mass file operation like moving a folder from one uh, drive to another. Uh, um, however, in, even in this method, uh, some files will likely get uh, sacrificed and, and then the attackers can uh, only encrypt maybe parts of the files or so random sections of files uh, or, or encrypt in chunks and uh, thus potentially bypass these, uh, 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 these detection methods. Okay, so this is uh, kind of my very non-scientific uh, uh, rating of the effectiveness of uh, uh, the five methods I, I just described from one to five. As you can see, none of them uh, are at, uh, at level five or even four. So, so that's one, uh, uh, that's why we still see uh, uh, ransomware headlines in the news almost, uh, almost every week. Um, and uh, that's why most um, endpoint security products actually combine multiple, if not all of these techniques in their products in the attempt to increase the overall efficacy but as as we all know uh, unfortunately the efficacy is still far far from uh, where it needs to be okay so let's uh, switch uh, gears a little bit um, no uh, ransomware presentation is uh, complete without mentioning wannacry right this is probably the most uh, well-known ransomware uh, that affected uh, over 150 countries, you know, billions and billions of uh, economic loss, uh, surgeries uh, had to be canceled, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Uh, and that's, everyone remembers about that. But what um, some people actually don't remember, um, I think, is that uh, WannaCry was actually completely stoppable, completely preventable, right? Because Microsoft actually released a, a patch for an underlying uh, uh, vulnerability almost full two months prior to the WannaCry attack happening. So the only thing you had to do to be fully protected from WannaCry was to leisurely within two months 
apply a Microsoft security patch. You didn't even have, you didn't need a firewall, you didn't need an antivirus, you didn't need any other fancy products to be fully protected from one attack. Um, and still, the damage was uh, substantial, as uh, just described on the previous slide. So, um, so what if um, what if there was a, a method that we actually don't have good defenses against, and that's um, that's um, uh, and there are many, I'm sure. Uh, this is just one interesting uh, uh, evasion technique that uh, our research team discovered uh, last year. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of details uh, on, uh, about this technique called replace. It stands for rest in peace and uh, uh, replace at the same time. Uh, so this is uh, an interesting technique. Uh, why is it interesting is because it's not just an evasion technique that allows you to bypass your antivirus or anti-ransomware products, but it also is a, is a blinding technique in the sense that it leaves no traces in tools like EDR, endpoint detection and response, that are meant to provide that kind of uh, a recording of all the events that happen on the on the, your laptops, desktops, and servers servers so that if attack happened and the damage was done, you can, so to speak, rewind the tape and, and, and investigate this incident and, and see how did the bad guys get in, when, what did they take, and, and hence, kind of, you'll be able to, uh, the idea is you'll be able to fortify your defenses so those uh, a similar attack in the future would not be successful. So the replace evasion technique actually not only bypasses the defenses, but also leaves no trace in those tools. And that's what makes it quite interesting. So what is uh, Replace exactly? If you remember one of the first slides I showed you how ransomware works and specifically how it get, uh, gets rid of the original unencrypted file. Well, uh, Replace is a variation of this fourth of the third method the rename operation. And uh, what um, exactly uh, happens here? Uh, it actually leverages um, a pretty obscure uh, function called define DOS device. Uh, what is define DOS device? It basically uh, uh, allows you to, instead of pointing to a file directly, use the symlink or, or symbolic link to point to it, right? It's kind of a shortcut, right? So instead of pointing, and you can create a, a sim link for a drive, for a folder, or you know, my secret cheesecake recipe, right? Um, so what happens uh, here is that <coughs> if, um, if uh, you pass a, a sim link to a, to a function that the security products typically hook in order to uh, 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 evaluate whether this file system operation is uh, legitimate or, or not, whether it's done by, you know, the virus or, or ransomware. Uh, if you pass, instead of a, a full path, you pass a sim link using defined DOS device, the operation, the, the driver actually receives an error code while the operation succeeds. So what happens here is that as the security products filter driver receives this uh, error code 33, it assumes that the operation failed and hence it skips all the detection, you know, malicious activity detection logic completely while the operation actually succeeds. So I, I know I'm going a little bit um, technical here and you can read much more details in, in our report about exactly how it works. And we have a sample code, a POC code posted on our GitHub uh, repo as well. But um, I think most interesting thing is to actually see a demo of this, of how this technique uh, can uh, bypass uh, um, some of the leading security uh, products. So I hope um, you can still see my screen. I have a VM running here. And what I have on this VM, I have some, um, some data in the, in the documents folder. So let's imagine there's some sensitive data here. 
And then uh, I also have a PROC1 running to see the, the results of the operation. And uh, in this demo, I'm showing, I'm using um, uh, Windows 10 uh, built-in anti-ransomware feature called a CFA or controlled folder access. Um, and uh, it's, as you can see, it's enabled. Um, it's uh, the folder I'm showing uh, um, the data in is part of the default configuration as part of the protected folders. So this CFA technique is meant to uh, specifically protect your data uh, and resist uh, a ransomware. So let's um, now uh, run a simulated ransomware and see what happens. Okay, I'm running a simulated ransomware here. And if you look at the Procmon results, see the process ransomware.exe, it attempted to uh, um, replace or encrypt these four files that we just looked at, and it got access denied. So CFA worked as expected, right? It prevented ransomware from uh, tampering with this data. So we can double check that the data is in, indeed intact. So now let's use the same ransomware, but that leverages now this evasion technique, this replace evasion technique that I just described. So now let's run replace. And something interesting has happened. One, we see that replace all four operations received uh, a result success. We don't see any, any folder or path or file name, anything, right? So it, it did something to nothing. But now let's look at the data itself. And as you'll see that actually the files were encrypted. The files are gone now. And, uh, and CFA did nothing, right? So, so that, that was interesting. So let me uh, um, roll back to another snapshot of uh, this, uh, this demo and show you an example of a different endpoint security product. Um, this time, it's not gonna be Microsoft CFA, it's gonna be a leading endpoint security product uh, by, by Symantec, Symantec Endpoint Protection or SEP. So um, here is setup is, is similar. We have uh, our Procmon, uh, we have uh, sensitive data. This time it's not, um, uh, it's not files uh, or, or images. This time it's, um, it's a host file, right? That's a pretty important file to protect. Um, and we can see the file is just fine right now. And SIP, um, Semantic Endpoint Protection, actually has lots of different uh, modules. It has the exploit mitigation and an unknown uh, threat detection and, and a variety of other uh, techniques. Everything is enabled, everything uh, default configuration. Um, and one of the interesting uh, capabilities that SEP has, it specifically has a protection against tampering with the uh, host file, a DNS uh, uh, a change and a host file uh, detection. And as you can see, those set to, to prompt if anyone attempts to, uh, to tamper with uh, these particular files. And as you can see, of course, the um, SAP is complaining here is actually, I didn't update the definitions at all, but uh, believe me, if I had, then uh, the result would be exactly the same. So that's, uh, that uh, does not really matter. Uh, so let's now run a simulated malware that, or, or ransomware that attempts to encrypt that host file that SEP protects. And let's see what happens. Looks like uh, SEP works exactly as, as designed, right? So someone is trying to uh, to tamper uh, or, or modify a host file, and we want to block or allow this. Well, obviously we want to block this. So if we look at the Procmon, you can see malware attempted to uh, uh, tamper with uh, this particular file and it received access denied. So let's double check that the file is fine. Okay, 
And so now I'm sure you already know where I'm going with this. And uh, now I'll attempt to do the same exact operation, but now leveraging this evasion technique called replace. And let's see what happens. Well, as, as expected, you can see replace.exe received uh, success in doing nothing. There's no file path, nothing. So you, you won't be able to really investigate this if, if this happened. And now let's look at the host file itself. What happened there? Well, not surprisingly, host file is now encrypted. So that's a kind of a quick demo. And, and again, replace is just one of dozens, if not hundreds of different techniques that the, the bad guys can, can leverage to, to bypass your defenses if those defenses leverage a blacklisting approach. There's just no way to stay ahead of the attackers 100% of the time if all you do is uh, attempt to uh, you know, uh, attempt to investigate and stop their new uh, new methods. So this uh, discovery received uh, quite a bit of coverage in the likes of Leaping Computer. Um, but um, what uh, can be useful for the audience potentially is that um, there is this very simple tool that we post on our website that you can test your uh, endpoint security product against this uh, for susceptibility to this replace technique. Um, it just attempts to encrypt one file on your desktop that you point it to. It just leverages XOR encryption. So obviously you can just rerun it and get that file decrypted again if your security tool was not able to stop it. So uh, some of you may, uh, may ask that, well, why um, uh, if this technique could be so potentially dangerous and damaging, uh, why release details about it, right? Well, obviously we followed the responsible disclosure process uh, and typically responsible disclosure is uh, well, three months, right? We actually gave the industry uh, about nine months. Um, uh, we, well, we reached out to Microsoft, we reached out to, to dozens of security vendors with the details uh, about this uh, evasion technique. Uh, and uh, we, we got some response and there were a handful of vendors that actually addressed this uh, issue in their uh, antivirus and uh, endpoint security products because it's actually fairly easy for security vendors to detect and, and properly handle rather this uh, evasion technique. But unfortunately from the most of the vendors we heard exactly nothing. So. At some point, you, you need to release this to, to the public uh, and, and, and hope to put pressure on the rest of the industry to, uh, to address this issue uh, to keep uh, our environments um, secure. That's uh, all um, I had to, to share with you. So happy to, to connect, um, um, happy to connect. Uh, uh, with anyone. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to connect with me. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this.